Nothing. Oh, yes. When I first went to England, I wondered why people wear the tie. It's only much later I discovered this is for the microphone. And unknown to the world, for 400 years, Western civilization had been evolving this apparatus. But you haven't worn a tie since. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. So we're missing the tie. <laughs> OK, we're both missing ties. So l where should we start? Let's not start at the beginning. Perhaps we'll go to the beginning. But let's start this morning uh, with the goddess of medium things and with the seven wishes of Amartya Sen. And what was on display, I think, to everybody who was here was your extraordinary gift. It's a storyteller's gift, I think, for making complicated things simple. And it's what allows you to reach such an enormous audience as you do. But I was wondering when I was listening to you whether you sometimes worry that in reaching that audience, the nuance in what you're saying, the ambiguity that shines through in your writing, the empirical and rational basis for your arguments gets uh, a little lost. The horror that you have for dogma and for slogan um, has been apparent throughout your career. And there's something a little reductionist about this. Does, does, do you feel that in reaching this large audience, you are compromising in any way? I actually don't feel that. Uh, that's not to say that what can be stated in a rather uh, differentiated story could be fully captured in the summary story. But it seems to me that the summary story is a different story. Uh, uh, and it, it, it relates to the fully differentiated comprehensive story in a way that's not um, uh, reductionist as such, but it's really trying to capture a central issue. Uh, and um, I mean, it's, of course, um, sometimes it's possible to lose that. Yeah. And, uh, and when that happens, I don't say, gosh, I have a problem because of the medium. I think I, my thought is that I just made a mistake. <laughs> I just implemented it somewhat differently. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I tried it, and some of my students uh, wanted to say that um, there's a princess of the country, and there's a royal uh, uh, queen who is abducted to an island, and people gather together and raise an army and try to free her. Uh, what am I talking about? And if they say I'm talking about Iliad and Odyssey, I can say, no, I was talking about Ramayana. <laughs> the fact is that both the stories are exactly the same, but they're not the same epic. Right, right. Well, let, let's move on from, from there and, and perhaps go back to the beginning. Perhaps go back to the, the early days of your career, your childhood in Chantaniketan, the very obvious connections and analogies, and you referred to it this morning yourself, with um, a mentor figure, I suppose, for you, Tagore. Uh, I think most people here will know of the Shantaniketan roots that, that you share, the uh, <coughs> philosophical attitudes and, and intellectual attitudes that I think you shared, the Bengali roots. Though I didn't know until three days ago or so when you told me that the very last essay that Tagore wrote in his life, The Crisis in Civilization, was actually delivered in 1941 shortly before Tagore's death by your grandfather. Yeah. Um, uh, but to talk to us a little bit ab ab about the influence of, of Tagore and perhaps using the text of this conversation, which is about freedom and choices, how he has influenced your attitude towards freedom and your approach to taking choices yourself in your career. Yeah, thank you for that question. When I first arrived in Chantinigeton, I have to say that this Tagore's influence didn't strike me as very strong. I was zero year, zero month, zero day old since <laughs> I was just being born. But then as I uh, 
spent here. You know, my father was a professor of chemistry in Dhaka, and we used to um, uh, go uh, to Santa Nikas on holidays often. Uh, that story, of course, much late, changed much later, thanks to a, for me, a happy accident, for many others possibly not so. The war moved to Japan, from, right. moved from Japan to Burma, and my father was convinced that the the, the Japanese will bomb Delhi and Calcutta, and, and, and sorry, Calcutta and Dhaka. So I was dispatched from Dhaka to my grandfather's place in Santa Niketan, which is a wonderful thing for me to happen. Mm. Uh, quite aside from the fact that, as my grandfather rightly said, that no Japanese bomber in his right mind will bomb Santa Niketan, and they didn't. But when it was all over and the Japanese retreated, I refused to go back to Dhaka. I liked it. And in that, was it Tagore's idea? There's something in his atmosphere, of course. The fact that I was in a rather disciplined school in, in, in Dhaka called St. Gregory's, which was an excellent school. On the other hand, there's an enormous focus on, on, on work and, and relatively little on play and thinking about the world. Much later, after, the, uh, after my novel, when I went to Dhaka and my Bangladeshi friends insisted I had to go to Dhaka before anywhere else, which I did, and the headmaster said that he got out some uh, exam papers of mine and he, um, he wanted to inspire the students. And then he said that he actually, after seeing that I was, a, I was 33rd in a class of 36. <laughs> he felt that it might not quite have that effect. <laughs> but my interest in studies became dramatically more only when I arrived in Santa Nikesan and there was absolutely no pressure right. on me to do anything. So I think his, but his, uh, Tagore's ideas interested me a lot. I've already, as a child, between the ages of three and six, been in Burma since my father had been there in Mandalay as a visiting professor. So I had some kind of a sense of international connection. And I think both, I think the three aspects of Tagore which hit me, one was while he was very proud of being an Indian and being a Bengali to some extent also, but at the same time, well, I would say to some extent, being an Indian, being a Bengali, but also being totally global, there was that and not seeing any contradiction. I did would write a book which your firm published, namely Identity and Violence. Yeah. Um, the second was, of course, his uh, importance uh, that he gave to reasoning about uh, everything uh, that is come your way rather than accepting it. If somebody asks you to do something, you have to ask why. Not an adequate answer to say that it's just done. And, uh, the third was the valuing of freedom. That, of course, was already witnessed in my own life in, in finding a school much better which I, where I, I was much freer than I was in a very disciplined school. So I think all these three things, uh, I, I don't know when they came, but they came bit by bit. By that time, Rabinata you know, Gore um, um, was nearly, well, to start with, dying and then he died. But of course, the writings were very strong and the ideas were very, very, very moving. Uh, I sometimes later, using my freedom, thought whether we didn't spend too much time on Tagore. Yeah. And I was among the rebellious group who wanted to read other things. I never used the word Guru Dev, mm. which is the way something you get on people often refer to them. Well, that seemed to me to be too religious way of seeing a person whom you admire mainly because he had good things to say, interesting things to say. So I never used the word Guru Dev and I wanted to transfer Guru Dev to yeah. Govinda Tagore, which but I was. The, broadening it then a little from Tagore, I mean, do you think that you imbibed either from him or more broadly from that extraordinarily eclectic Bengali tradition? tradition, this breadth and range that has characterized your career. So you were very early in your career developing an interest in moral philosophy. 
it has never seemed a problem for you to sort of range across politics, social issues, moral issues, as you did this morning in a rather breathtaking way. That, that's always come very naturally to you, to see intellectual activities as a somewhat seamless pursuit. Is that something that you think, was that a choice that you made, or is that something that you inherited from your background? Oh, I think it's always a combination of that. Uh, I think for me, uh, I was, you see, when I was very young, uh, the two subjects that fascinated me most were maths and Sanskrit. Uh, and uh, they continued to fascinate me. And even when I was going to college, it wasn't clear. I mean, I began eventually doing maths and physics and then under the influence, particularly of a very good friend of mine, Sukhumar Chakravarti, who was doing economics. I decided to move on. But math was a big thing, but so was Sanskrit. And I, um, uh, since I was never religious, uh, I, I think I can't remember a time when I was religious, except in some moment of having severe stomachache and <laughs> wanting some kind of miracle to happen. But in the absence of stomachache, I don't think I've ever been religious. Uh, but the... Um, when I argued with my grandfather on that, I mean, he was, he wrote the most successful English book on Hinduism, namely the Penguin Hinduism, in fact, came out uh, 60 years ago and it's still in print. Only one of the five religion books that were done is still in print. But he had done that and so I told him that I didn't have any religious belief. And he said, no, he was always opposed to people having religious beliefs until they can think about it. And, uh, and when you think about it, it will come to you. And then later I said, like, well, I'm beginning to reason that it's not coming to me. I don't think it's for me. And he said, no, you're reading the wrong thing. You have to read the right things in the, in the, in the tradition. So then he gave me books on by, uh, or about, uh, by and about Chavaka and the local art school. This is for those who are not aware, um, a materialist school, atheistic, very reason-oriented, not accepting anything other than that, other than evidence. Mm. Even having a wonderful discussion about how life comes as a mixture of material objects. Very materialist, I think now, probably in some ways too crudely materialist. But anyway, so and then I said, yes, I could, uh, I could live with that. And then my grandfather said, oh, I see, you have now placed yourself in the atheistic, materialist branch of Hinduism. <laughs> so I recognize there's no escape. Uh, one way or another, I'm there. But I was very grateful, and they lived. You see, by the way, for those who haven't read it, I think the best introduction to, to um, Charvaka and Lokayata is in the, is the 14th century book by a man called Madhavacharya from Tamil Nadu who had a book called Sarvadarshan Sangaha, Collection of All Philosophies. And there is a, the first chapter is on Loka at school. And uh, the, there are, I think, uh, 16 chapters or 18, I can't think. Each chapter presents a point of view with great sympathy. And the next top chapter demolishes it. But when he's presenting the Loka at thing, I think that's the best presentation I've seen of what the uh, school of thought was. But the reasoning was very central to that. Uh, and, uh, that word, I mean, you used in your Nobel acceptance speech, the banquet speech in 1998, a, a phrase that I think is very memorable, which is the, the clear stream of reason. And you use it, in fact, in association with, with some ideas about, about De Gaulle. And, and that, the words reason and reasoning uh, surface often in, in your writings. And it seems to me that you are often drawn to complex issues which are susceptible to rational analysis, but where there is a clear moral dimension to the issue. You aren't interested in the study for the study's sake. So when you were talking this morning about the position of women in society in India, something that you've written very recently on in, in, in the New Yorker, th that is uh, an issue to which you apply an enormous amount of forensic statistical analysis but to a moral purpose, or sometimes to a political yeah. purpose. And is, is that the kind of, in, kind of inquiry that instinctively attracts you? Oh, it certainly attracts me. 
But I think I would be, I would be lying if I said that's the only thing that uh, right. attracts me. Because the two subjects, uh, I mean, I, I, at the moment, of course, I'm both professor of economics and of philosophy at Harvard. But in Delhi School of Economics, when I was teaching, I did teach philosophy courses. Mm. But they were never on moral philosophy. One was a course on mathematical logic, another was a course on epistemology. And they interested me also very much, though the moral dimension isn't very important. And it's a little like the different identities. I don't see that the, even though the moral aspects have had a great hold on me, that it could exclude me from taking an interest in, in mathematical logic or in, um, or in the personality. There's an interesting story connected with the poem, poem of Rabindranath that you point out. I, right. I, I read out in the Nobel dinner. That's not a Nobel lecture, which is a different thing. No. This is after dinner, and you have to make a four or five minute speech very quickly. And uh, so I quoted them with a mind is without fear. But uh, you in my Horace. One? You quoted Horace to begin with, didn't you? On silliness. Oh, yeah, I, did, I think I probably did quote no. Horace, yeah. Yes, I think I did. But, the, but, you know, I wasn't the first to quote that form of the goal. Uh, it was Chandrasekhar. When he got the Nobel, in his Nobel banquet dinner, quote, uh, quoted that. And in my Nobel banquet dinner, I quoted Chandrasekhar quoting the goal. <laughs> so that was the thing. But the goal, uh, Chandrasekhar had a problem because the last line, as you might remember, in that heaven, right. in that heaven of freedom. Now, as, in, as a non believer, he didn't believe in heaven, therefore, he couldn't say in that heaven. So he did a rather extraordinary compromise. He called in that haven of freedom. <laughs> That's my country anyway. So that gave me some pause. Right. And that pause has come back to me because I don't believe in heaven either any more than he did. But it seems to me that it doesn't exclude me from referring to heaven. I had some very interesting discussion uh, uh, last month uh, with um, Vidyan S.M. Krishna, who had written a remarkable book called the, A Southern Music, The Carnatic Story. Wonderful book on Carnatic music. And he goes into that question, and I, 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 I spent two days with him in Kalakshetra, and on the question that if I didn't believe in heaven, can I refer to heaven? It's the same question that a lot of the Carnatic music is very devotional. Does that mean without that devotion I cannot enjoy it? And as Krishna argues rightly, uh, I mean, by the way, this is the best book I've read in. Nobody asks, usually people ask me at the end of the month, what's the, what's the best book you have read? And usually I kind of say, well, I don't know, maybe A, maybe B, did I say B, actually perhaps C, and so on. So they've all given me up. But I was hoping somebody asked me, I would tell Karnatic. It's a problem for a publisher as well, being asked that question. <laughs> well, I second. agree. No. Yeah. But I think the important thing is that our ability to imagine a world including that of the religiosity, is great. Otherwise, we couldn't make sense of even Christian, uh, not only Gregorian chants and so on, but also paintings and sculpture, which are moved by religious uh, belief. And it's not just in, in the India case, not only Karnataka, a lot of the Hindustani classical music are devotional too, what the music is. And it seems to me that that's an epistemological question, not a moral question. Right. Is the whole world available to me, even if it is not a world in which I have a belief, because I can think of it? Now, all novels are like that. They place you. I mean, when I yeah. read, I can't even begin to think. I had once time to read The War and Peace three times. But when I had that time, I was in a world of Russia, which wasn't my own. But I was in it while I was reading it. So I think that by the time I went to all that, uh, Chandrasekhar, who I have greatly admired, was no longer with us. Uh, I would have liked to have had a wonderful uh, instruction for me, Mr. Whether I'm think right in thinking that way or not. So I think it's 
morality, but this, this is the purely epistemological question, yeah. and so on. Yeah. I think all these does, but you're right that in, to the extent that I'm concerned with integrity of the economic morality is quite strong in that, and there's no way of escaping that. I don't claim any credit for it after all the subject began with Adam Smith, professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow, and where he says in the theory of moral sentiments, which is the first book, that the economic parts of it had to be played as we separated out, and I'm planning to write a book on it. And that is the wealth of nations. That was seen as a little adventure within the corpus of the theory of moral sentiments. I think that's just right. And Adam Smith remains a huge influence on your thinking. Huge today. influence, and also a huge influence that the morality should not allow you to make any compromise, whatever, with what you can uh, empirically defend. Right. I mean, that is to say that some, to you it's too, for, to me it's not too, in a kind of, uh, well, in the same kind of allegorical sense that I was exploiting this morning, um, there may be uh, some case in that, but generally I'm not a relativist, uh, and uh, I think uh, we have to, there, there is a, reasoning can settle most of these disputes if you have sufficient evidence. Well, I get to finish, we'll move on in a second, but, but you talked about the Nobel lecture. There was a Nobel lecture that you gave in Cambridge in 1998, and there was a phrase in that that I thought summarized the sort of binary way in which you think about these things. You said, our deeply felt real-world concerns have to be substantively integrated with the analytical use of formal and mathematical reasoning. So there's the reasoning word again. And, and you would still stand by that yes. summary? Okay. Yes, I do. I mean, partly because I'm, well, partly I'm biased because I, I am very involved with mathematics still. This year I did teach a postgraduate maths course at Harvard. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a success. And so I have not done some of these maths for about 40 years. It was good for me to get back to it. Right. But I think maths is a wonderful world. Mm. And I think where things go wrong is that, and it used to go wrong in economics a lot. When I was a student in presidency college, I did a maths and economics joint degree. But the maths we did was physics mostly. Mm. Differential equations and so on, calculus of variation. I'm not going to denigrate them, and indeed I... I did my, my first book was Choice of Techniques, and when I did, uh, it wasn't dying, it just went on and on. For right. a PhD thesis, for it to come to a third edition, third reprint, I thought that I was really getting bad, so I had to add a little forward, and then I used the calculus of variation there. But mostly, the kind of math we need is a rather higher value math, and less, um, um, numerical math. I mean, they, are, they deal with, first of all, uh, the world of ordering and ranking, with allowing incomplete ranking, the world of fuzzy orders and fuzzy sets. So all these are parts of math too. So those who say that, um, it sometimes happened, I recently gave a lecture in memory of my friend Dipankar Chatterjee, who was a classmate and who died uh, not long ago, and he was a professor of physics, uh, and he, so when I was talking, I was recollecting some discussion about objectivity, and I was saying, it's a debate that we have had, namely the maths that we have to use in understanding many of the social sciences are different kind of maths from that of the Newtonian mechanics and, and so on, and which is really what people did in economics right. for, for, well, almost 150 years. Uh, I think the change came with von Neumann, uh, Nash, uh, and, and that was only around 1950 that things were changed. Kenneth Arrow and De Vaux, things changed. So I think um, sometime the, if we try to make a statement with a level of exactitude that a physical object would have. Right and you want to capture it in that math, you'll be making a huge mistake. On the other hand... The goddess of medium things also believes this. 
God is a medium thing, firmly believes it. Firmly believes it. I wonder where he got that <laughs> idea. Um, but the, uh, um, I think if it's not, if you think that the object is in itself imprecise, as Aristotle rightly said, I think I quoted him too, yeah. is that you have to capture that, that ambiguity. Ambiguity is something central there, yeah. rather than something you lose. But uh, sometimes math may not be any use there, but sometimes it is a huge amount of use. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, the whole of probabilistic calculation uh, um, are basically dealing with a territory of ambiguity. Because these probabilities really don't mean anything very much other than, as, uh, you know, they, there's frequency, but frequency won't tell you what will happen in the future, what has happened in the past. So it is what your beliefs are, what bets you'll take. Yeah. What bets you take will depend on what degree of confidence you have. And you won't have so much confidence that you would, uh, you know, um, unlike a <coughs> great character like Judith Steele, uh, uh, absolutely uh, bet on the, uh, give everything to it, your kingdom, your wife and everything. Uh, I don't think people do that because right. they don't think that the, these are such unambiguous matters. So I think in some informal way, uh, I mean the epic itself is a statement of that ambiguity. The whole of the debate between Krishna and Arjun as to why, whether you can say it's my duty to win the war, therefore to kill even if it means killing a lot of people for whom I have affection and who are related to me, which is Arjun's point of view. I think contrary to, to um, common statement, I don't believe Arjun's arguments uh, go away. That doesn't mean that Krishna's arguments are but, nonsensical either, because he is saying that there is some sense of duty. So I think there's an ambiguity there. Which now this is a hypothetical capture. question, but do, but do you think you would have grown up with a different view of ambiguity if your text as a youth had been, let's say, the Bible or the Quran rather than the Ramayana or the Mahabharata? Or, do, do, you, do you think that you, you learned about uh, ambiguity and relished ambiguity because of the evident ambiguities in the, those great epic texts? Well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the if you take Quran and Bible in the New Testament as a particular set of beliefs, this will be comparable to a particular school of Hinduism, like, uh, you know, like uh, Shankara or someone like right. that. Uh, on the other hand, what we are thinking of is that you could believe in that and you may have, you may be formally Christian, or you may be formally uh, 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 Muslim, but that doesn't prevent you from having what we were discussing earlier, right. that flight of imagination. I think the best book on India ever written is the book written by Al Biruni yet in, in, in 10, 10, around 1010 10 AD, so more than a thousand years ago, called Tariq Al Hind, the right. history of India. And <coughs> among other things, I mean, he discusses mainly Indian math. He was a mathematician, but an Indian astronomy. But he also goes on to the question of monotheism and polytheism. And he's obviously, as a Muslim, bothered by the, the, uh, the charge of polytheism. And then he produces a defense, which I would read much later in the writings of the Brahmo school in the 19th century. Now, even though there are very many manifestations, the belief in that there is one God behind it, that argument is a 1010 AD argument mm -hmm. by Al Biruni. And he, he also said there is an ambiguity here which we can't lose, which can't go away. On the other hand, if you talk with a philosophical Hindu, philosophical Indian, he didn't distinguish between India and Hindu at that time. He came in about 990 AD and then and was there in India for decades. But, but Ultimately, their belief is of this kind, yes. which I cannot describe exactly, precisely. So I think it would depend 
on, uh, you know, if, and same thing would apply. I mean, after all, Galileo was a Christian too. We forget that. So I think, in, I think the short answer is no. I think one could have developed that depending on how much uh, independence you want to exercise. Right, so it's no, it's not ambiguous, okay. No. So th why don't we move forward uh, a millennium then to perhaps the second best book on India ever written, which you published with uh, Jean Dres last year, India and Uncertain Glory. And that is a book which is full of uh, mathematical analysis and support and indeed full of, of ambiguity, but, but also has a very clear social message, yeah. one or two perhaps political messages as well. But uh, and I'm going to um, quote Tagore here, uh, the essay Nationalism in India, but he wrote exactly a century before that book was published in 1913, when he said, <laughs> our real problem in India is not political, it is social. That could have been a text perhaps for your, for your own book. I mean, our real problem is perhaps not political or economic, it, it, it is social. But you did spend a, 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 a lot of time in, in that book with Jean discussing the inadequacy of social interventions in, in India. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very great statement of, uh, of Rabindranath. On the other hand, I wouldn't say it's not political. I would say the politics here is very social, in fact. Right. It's a little like the statement that Karl Marx makes when he's talking about, well, it happens at different places, including in, uh, in his more philosophical writing, um, that about the individual and society, that Ultimately, the individual is the important thing to look at. He's not being one of those things who deny, one of those writers deny the existence of individual. But you cannot ever think of the individual detached from the social context. So I would say here, a it, it, lot of the politics of India should be much more attached to the social context right. than they have been. And, you know, to worship GDP growth for its own sake. GDP growth is very important. It's one of the big means of advancement. But to think of it as a um, reward in itself and not attach it to what makes the GDP grow and what can we do with the GDP, individual income and so on, that would be a big mistake. The, the great guru, as he is often called, uh, Adam Smith of the market economy in a very crystal clear passage in the Wealth of Nations says why do we want a successful economy and effectively is asking the question why do we want high growth rate and he said there are two reasons one it increases individual income and two it allows the state to have more money thanks to economic growth to do those things which the state alone can do and do well so I think that comes straight out of Adam Smith. Our book is driven a lot by that insight. You, you talked this morning about the, not in relation to this issue, but, but about the responsibility of, of media um, uh, on gender issues in India. Would you extend your remarks here about the <coughs> class to media? Should, should the media be more sensitive to the social dimension of political issues? Oh, it certainly should be. Uh, there's no way of escaping the fact that the media uh, would be run by people who are, come from the intellectual class and, and as such a privilege. Right. They had primary school, secondary school, undergraduate, postgraduate often, and they had chance of studying it. So we can't escape that. But, so to say that since the media is run by intellectuals, we can never um, g get over the bias, I think it's a mistake. And I think that's a, that's a crude kind of materialism which I don't think really applies. Right. But we have to be careful because it's very hard to see where the interests are when you have never met a person I was doing a program only the other day with uh, Gloria Stein and Rutia uh, uh, Gupta and, 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 
uh, uh, you know, several of us uh, uh, together um, um, about um, we'll see, we'll see with Talia together. Yeah. Um, about things like rape and sexual trafficking. Now, one of the reasons why rape gets much more attention is that rapes can happen even to the very, very rich. Uh, it seems to happen quite often to tourists for some reason in India. Uh, and the, even though most of the rapes are not of that kind, most of the rapes actually happen to Dalit women, but at least it does happen. Sexual trafficking hardly ever happened to any family. I asked all the people, there was an audience, yeah. do you know of anyone whose family might have had a little child, little girl taken away for sexual trafficking? No. There's a big class divide there. And that makes sexual trafficking much harder to put in the yeah. paper. That was part of which here Gupta uh, uh, complained, that it makes it very difficult. And I think that barrier remains. But I think to, uh, um, whenever we face a barrier of that kind, if you do have the faith in the power of, uh, of reasoning that we can work through, is to say that, look, can we not make people reflect on, on that? There was a wonderful paper written by um, a friend of mine who's been dead for many years now, Ashok Rudra, a great economist, called Intellectuals as a Ruling Class in India. And he points out how the ruling class is small, but the intellectuals belong to it. And it's very difficult to, for us to see beyond. But knowing also, I don't think he was saying, therefore we are doomed. He right. was saying, therefore be aware. And yeah. that Ambedkar statement that we kept quoting in the book, namely, uh, educate, organize, agitate, applies too also. So when I'm appealing to the media to take a little bit more interest to where the deprivations are and look at the numbers as to how much money is being spent on food and employment before you damn them without saying one thing about cooking gas and diesel, fertilizers and subsidized electricity. So subsidized that every time I come to a hotel in India I have to switch off the air conditioner because it's so wretchedly cold, run on subsidized electricity paid for by the people of India. <laughs> Japanese, by the way, the incidentally uh, intelligence, if I may, when I made a comparison, I was traveling. Japan, they run 24 degrees, the taxis run. And the, uh, in Hong Kong uh, and, and Bangkok and Beijing, they run to 22 degrees. We run between 16 to 19 degrees. You know, I was the only place where I had to take a muffler and <laughs> to, to go to a restaurant. Um, I, think, I think something has deeply gone wrong, and the media doesn't seem to really do anything to right. take notice of that. That's a failure. But I wouldn't say it's an inescapable failure, because you come from the upper class and you are part of the ruling class. I would say it's an escapable failure. And you failed because you haven't done your job as a, as a, as a journalist. Namely, detach your, your own, detach yourself from your background. Well, sh should we, we, there's obviously a lot of ruling class intelligentsia here in the, in the hall. Should we open the uh, conversation up? Are you happy to take some questions? Amartya from the hall. If, if I could ask you, please, we haven't got all, all of that long. And if I could ask you to ask a qu question rather than make an observation or, or a speech. And perhaps to, just one question to keep the question relatively short. We've got one here at the front and then one I'll take at the, at the back, lady at the back. Yes, uh, it would not be an overstatement if I say, uh, no could be better understand the social choice theory as you do. My question is related to that. In all but small organizations, social choice takes place from delegation of power from many to few. But sometimes the agents don't act in the interest of the, those who really delegate the power. Is there any mechanism by which we can harmonize the social choice of the agents with the public? In a democracy, in the corporation, you take over the corporation. In, in democracy, you can change the parliament. In a communist party, you dismantle the central committee by cultural revolution. And 
what is your suggestion is there any other mechanism than this thank you but you you yourself are talking about those things their power comes from different things power comes from money which is very important uh, it could be very important in america it's very important in india too i mean especially now many of our election campaign are being run as if they are business event you know we, before you arrive a friend of mine Joe Dredge my quarter wrote he went to one of those things and he said this was in Jharkhand he said before we were arriving every every uh, old fashioned was furlong <laughs> you saw the same picture of the same leader and they gradually becoming larger and larger i don't know whether you know in television when you're being interviewed you begin small and you become larger and larger so it happens it's all done visually well so money has power uh certainly when you suppress opposition like you mentioned in many communist countries happened opposition and and uh, there are communist countries like that also even today that happens there's also the power of vote there's the power of propaganda but media is a big source of power too you know one of the thing is interesting thing is that media sometimes underestimate its own power you see the human rights commission in india is a legally constituted body it has a standing it can do many things in pakistan the human rights commission is just an ngo so they don't have that but by using the media they have been able to have quite a bit of effect in all kinds of ways one of the great ones was when in the swat valley this uh, young uh, young woman was caned for having violated some taliban norm and the uh, pakistan media had covered it but only as a small story and the military had said they wouldn't intervene in this because it's too complicated and then one of the activists of the pakistan human rights commission at a great list risk to his life went to that announced caning and made a long telephone call which could be seen he was in fact making a video if he had been caught there he would have been killed but he wasn't caught he took the video he came out and put the video in the hands of the pakistan television network and they came out in all the networks and the result was that they revolted and it was one thing to read in page 17 you know uh, some woman had been badly treated it's like saying well we believe 50% of indians defecate in the open but it's not a story until there's something right. dramatic when that happened the uproar in pakistan was so strong that the military had to intervene this was brought out entirely by media and with the help of courageous in this case i mean many journalists could do many good things without that kind of courage of taking the risk of your life in going to fort valley to video it but uh, to underestimate its power would be a great mistake so power comes from different sources and to say th there is no uh, a kind of uh, contrast between social choice and power power is what social choice is about question at the back you have a lady back uh, raising her hand right back there could we, could we get you yes could we get you a microphone The lady right at the back there if we could there's a microphone coming Thank you <coughs> Um Dr Sen I was first introduced to your work as a developmental economist in Presidency College when we were celebrating 175 years and um, our professors instructed us to prepare an exhibition of all the accomplished presidents and actually yourself and dr shukumar chakraborty prominent uh, prominently featured on the collage my question sir is 
how do we restore um, the glory of you know educational institutions like presidency college uh, as world class institutions and uh, what can we do to um, you know inculcate the whole morality and the discipline freedom and um, to back into the educational system which is now lost so how do we achieve this and is it important to address these questions well it's a very good question again um you know i think there are two different issues how these elite institutions could be made to function as well as one could have hoped uh, and how to build, build new elite institutions and i'm engaged particularly with nalanda university which was of course the oldest university in the world and had an impeccable quality uh, consciousness so there is that issue and presidency will fall in that not just in calcutta but also in 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 chennai and elsewhere uh, but there is also a question of the general standard of education one has to think about that question and that goes all the way to the even primary school even though i spent my life teaching higher education um i began my life teaching primary school in the sense that when i was finishing in santiniketan at the age of um uh oh guess i must have been uh, uh 14 or 15 we ran the night school in the tribal villages and there are number of very proud that the number of people who could read and write had been educated by me at that time now the primary school has become a absolutely enormous bastion of inequality now as it happened the uh, my old given that the school teachers are not paid very well is no longer that true their salaries have gone up a lot sometimes they are the richest person in the village on the other hand we need a much more um engagement in looking after the um uh, interest and abilities particularly of the students coming from uh poor families quite often first time anyone going to school in that family which really means that the parents can't help in any way at all now i think uh, the with my nobel money i started to trust one in bangladesh one in india bangladesh one is kind of concerned with gender inequality the indian one is primarily primary school though and now working quite a bit on primary health care but in the primary school thing then we have let the quality consciousness go down the inspector system is gone and if the idea of uh, uh, as in the right to education uh, pass fail uh, be uh, be abolished for which there is a case without um making arrangements for testing we really are in difficulty there are two different issues pass fail is not a very good way of giving incentive to teachers because teacher said you know the kid is no good he failed or she failed so i think to say pass fail will bring in incentive is not right but not having any testing means no one is testing that at all what's going on so the we have a meeting every year arranged by for the teachers of parents and 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 uh, uh, parents and teachers and one of the thing that emerged last month in that meeting is that there is a strong support for the idea that without fast fail we could have regular testing and in order to make it more objective the testing could be shared one school testing another there are all kinds of ways in which we could make the quality consciousness go up and not you know it really so down that we have to begin by pulling up so i think i'm delighted you raised the question i only wish that you would broaden it and not only include the elite institution but all the educational institution at all levels can i broaden it a little and just touch on the first of your wishes this morning which is the teaching of of humanities in in india and do you have any practical proposals as to how we might or the, the country might redress that balance which i'm sure is a concern so to me as a publisher but to a lot of people who are here today 
Well, I think the, it's partly, you know, I think we are influenced by how we um, evaluate people's work. I mean, if the general understanding is that humanity is, is for, for the not so right, right, then we won't get there anywhere at all. So I think we got quite a lot of it. I'm sorry to use this old-fashioned word. Quite a lot of it is at its top. But uh, the issue is that it doesn't lead to secure, secure well-paid employment. Isn't that the more the issue? Than there the is that, and that we need to be looked at. This is very odd, actually, because if you look at the industrial wage structure, which I looked at about 40 years ago when I was teaching in, 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 in Delhi, more than 40 years ago, um, that quite often in the management, the engineers get a sinecure job that proceeds, but the general manager did history or something right. like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's to some extent a financial incentive, but I think we tend to underestimate the social incentive yeah. of admiration and, uh, and how often we quote people, etc. And I think we can do a lot but the media has a role in that too. Yeah. Media has a role in everything, in all the communication. So I don't have a uh, quick answer. Right. It's not like in the, um, one of the early footlight reviews in, in England, where it came, there was a Ministry of Defense guy who comes in and said, do you have any question? And, and then one of them uh, uh, said, I have five questions about nuclear power and to which, before hearing, the Ministry of Defense says, and I have five answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have time for one question. So there's a la lady there, just uh, uh, near the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sen, I just wanted to, uh, this goes back to the first point. Or you the have to go closer. Sorry. Um, I, I can't hear very well. Mm. Okay. Um, this goes back to your first point about the individual and society. Um, and I was just wondering if you could comment on what has happened in Delhi recently with the emergence of a new political party, um, you know, the Aam Aadmi Party, and the fact that the public has got a chance to uh, voice its opinion. And I was wondering if you could comment on that and what that means for politics in India today. Well, I, I have commented on it on the press, actually. Um, namely, that um, it was wonderful that a party could appeal to their sense of grievance, reason grievance, about the way the country may be run, not just the government, but also the principal opposition party. And the sense that we need something different. The fact that that message communicated is enormously to the credit of the Indian voters. What is much more problematic, of course, is that if you then come to office, you have to know what is it that you're trying to do. And if it is to have exactly what the other middle class oriented parties have done, namely make the power even cheaper, so that the hotel temperature need not be 16 degrees, could be 14 degrees. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily meeting the mandate. I'm not blaming the Ahmadmi for it because they're new into the game. Uh, and we have to give them a bit of time. And I still am very positively inclined to cheer them. On the other hand, while we cheer them, they have to start thinking much more clearly what is it exactly they want, what is it, and how they're going to bring that about, and who the common people are. Who are the Ahmadmi? Are the Ahmadmi are, are, are the people who need cheaper cooking gas and cheaper diesel fuel? and cheaper electricity, or Ahmad with the people who have no power connection, who have no water connection, and who don't know what to do. Thank you. I'm really sorry. I know there are lots more questions in the hall. I'm afraid we are going to have to end it there. In um, Amartya Sen's Wikipedia entry under the heading of hobbies, Vic, he, he's quoted as saying, I read a lot and I like arguing with people. We're very grateful to you for spending an hour arguing with us today, Amartya. Thank you very much. Let's give a very warm round of applause to Amartya Sen and John Makinson.